Okay. Let's resume. Uh, you see this announcement that there is going to be a group picture taken at 1.45 before we resume at 2 o'clock. We selected 1.45 because just before, from 1.30 to 1.45, there is in this auditorium the talk for Claudia to, to Brazilian attendees. So as soon as her talk is over, we'll ask everyone to be outside at 1.45 so that we can take a group picture outside. I mean, uh, somebody already took reparage to see exactly where, I mean, everyone could be and that we could uh, fit everyone in a picture. So 145, please, just before we come back at two o'clock, we will take that group picture. So now we can resume and introduce the next speaker, Daniel Kahn. Daniel is at the Laboratory of Biometrie and Biology Evolutive in Lyon, University of Lyon 1, France. And he worked for a long time on nitrogen fixation on plant and bacteria uh, um, interaction. And he was, I mean, one of the persons responsible for the sequencing of the Ribosobium, Sinorisobium melilloti genome, uh, which was, I would say, the culmination of a lot of work in trying to understand, I mean, uh, the molecular basis of natural fixation. Not that it's finished, I know there's so many things to do. And at one point in his career, he started developing, I mean, uh, Prodom, and that's already uh, now 12 years ago, if I'm correct, in 94, he published a paper with Eric Zonhammer. Uh, Prodom being a protein domain database, which was quite different than other protein domain database that existed before because it's a wholly automatically generated uh, domain database. And so he's very well known for the so Prodom database. Recently has worked on studying of metabolic pathway and uh, inference on the Priam, what's called Priam. And uh, so as links Geographical links for Daniel, I've put Paris, where he has worked for a long time, I mean, uh, with uh, his work on natural fixations, and Toulouse, where he has been for, I think, 20 years, or like that. And recently, he moved to Lyon, I think it's two years ago, one year and a half ago, I think. And so, biological link, bio links, I put Florence Corpet, Florence Servet, and Jérôme Gouzy, and Emmanuel Courcel with whom he has worked a lot in Toulouse to develop various aspects of Prodom and Priam. And Eric Sonheimer, who was also at the very beginning of, uh, involved in the very beginning of Prodom. So thank you, Daniel, for being here. Thank you, Amos. Uh, maybe I, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, thank you, Amos, for this uh, introduction. And maybe I should also uh, 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 mention some some remembrances I have from uh, the late 80s when uh, I worked on, in Toulouse on uh, regulation of nitrogen fixation in rhizobium. And at that time, we were sequencing uh, very interesting regulatory genes, which turned out to be uh, two component regulatory systems. And uh, there was a professor from Geneva. Uh, whose name is Lucien Caro, who frequently came. And when he came, he systematically brought uh, some programs with him. And these programs actually were Amos's. Uh, we were very fortunate in those days in that we could benefit from very fast translation into uh, easily usable uh, programs of methods that would be published in the literature. So thanks, Amos, again, for all this input also in the early days. So my talk is going to be about uh, protein domain families and protein innovation. So the classical paradigm of, of modular protein evolution is that uh, 
proteins evolve essentially as uh, new combinations of pre-existing domains. And this is a classical paradigm that has uh, held, I would say, since uh, the early 90s. And this is a paradigm that underlies our major uh, protein domain databases. And Prodom is one of these. And, um, well, my research interest for a long time has been on understanding this modularity. So that's what at the sequence level with the Prodom project, where we systematically compared all protein domains, protein sequences to extract uh, protein domain families, but also at the experimental level, where on two component regulatory systems, we studied the interaction between uh, the various domains, in particular for this protein, which is called FixJ here. Uh, which is a very simple two-domain protein, uh, and so we, we studied the interaction between the regulator domain and the output domain. And it was very nice to be able to, to match these functional analysis uh, with the sequence analysis. And of course, what is very classical now, is that there's a huge diversity of modular domain arrangements in this family of uh, essentially bacterial uh, regulatory proteins. So my talk will be about exploring the evolution of protein domains. So how do we go uh, to do this? Well, first, we start with domain families that are systematically constructed by comparison of all available sequences. I think the important word here is systematic, in that we don't want to, to be uh, limited only to pre-existing knowledge about domain families. We want to systematically scan all available sequences construct domain families, that's what we do precisely when we construct prodon. Then we restrict the analysis to complete a sequence genome, what we call prodon CG. And from these protein domain families, we can deduce phylogenetic profile. That are simple uh, Boolean vectors with ones or zeros. Um, the dimension of this vector is exactly the number of genomes, complete genomes that are available. And um, we want to interpret these phylogenetic profiles. And the way we interpret them in this work I'm going to present is to model evolutionary scenarios that best explain these phylogenetic profiles, that is, this phylogenetic distribution of a particular domain family. And for this, we, we use Bayesian network methodology. So now I've got just two slides to introduce Bayesian network for uh, those of you who not familiar with them. So, Bayesian networks are defined as directed acyclic graphs. At each node of the graph, a random variable is associated. Usually it's a discrete uh, variable. And then conditional dependencies are associated with edges. So here I've taken a picture from uh, Neil Friedman with a very small uh, Bayesian network which has five nodes, essentially. Um, an alarm can trigger a call if there is an incident, severe incident in, a, in your house. It could be either a burglary or an earthquake. Um, and uh, in case of an earthquake, of course, there is also a likelihood that this will be announced somewhere on the radio. So around this uh, network, uh, we have random variables associated at each node and these conditional dependencies that are expressed in conditional probability distributions at each node. So for instance, this table expresses all the conditional probabilities that an alarm will be triggered depending on the various states of the two other parent nodes. Now how do we use Bayesian networks? Now the advantage is that we have, there is a whole set of methods that are standard and available to use these networks. Now if I've got and some evidence. In this case, it would be uh, an alarm call. Now, this will change the probability of the states of the other nodes of the network. For instance, it will increase the probability that an earthquake may have um, been have occurred or that a burglary has occurred. So, the Bayesian network methodology allows us to calculate posterior probabilities for any event, that is, any state of each node, given any evidence. And also, it provides for most likely explanation. That is the single scenario that best explains the evidence. And now, if I have another evidence, additional evidence, now these probabilities 
also possibly these optimal scenarios will change. Uh, so we have this so-called explaining a gray effect. So how do we use these Bayesian networks for modeling evolutionary scenarios? Well, we start with a very simple graph, which is a tree, which is a phylogenetic species tree, so rooted at Luca, the last universal human ancestor, and the leaves being contemporary species. And the phylogenetic profiles of a given protein domain family are just mapped on the leaves of this tree. And then the game, of course, will be to propagate this evidence in the tree. So the advantages of Bayesian networks uh, to do this compared with uh, what is more classical um, parsimony analysis uh, to infer similar things is that Bayesian networks are very flexible. They are more general and rigorous than parsimony analysis. Uh, they allow for different parameter classes. That is, they allow for different gain or loss probabilities at each node. And indeed, uh, our current understanding of, of evolution indicates that gain and loss frequencies can vary widely. Parameters can be estimated using expectation maximization with missing information. And therefore, it's not just button tuning uh, to, to get to the parameter value that fits best uh, to your own bias, but uh, you can train the, the network to really estimate parameters. And then propagate, propagation of evidence uh, provides not only for most probable explanation of evidence, but also for marginal state probabilities at all known. And finally, Bayesian networks uh, take into account potentially very complex scenarios. For instance, scenarios in which uh, a domain might be lost, followed by a regain, etc. So, in a sense, Bayesian networks are more rigorous and they generalize parsimony analysis. So we use this methodology for all protein domain families, non-trivial protein domain families in Prodom CG to infer most probable uh, evolutionary scenarios. So these are available on Prodom CG. So this is the restriction of Prodom to all sequences from completed genomes. And then we have analyzed systematically these evolutionary scenarios. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, what are the questions we ask? For each family at each node of the taxonomy tree, uh, we ask whether the family is novel. That is, is it first found since uh, uh, the last universal common ancestor? If it's novel, we ask whether it's phylum specific. We ask whether this family may have been lost. And therefore, we can deduce the number of such events at each node of the taxonomy tree. So there's domain innovation going on, or prevailing to horizontal transfer, domain loss, etc. So first of all, when we do this analysis, we started by analyzing uh, the root of the tree, Luca, and the three more the deepest node. That is the bacterial root, the archaeal root, and the, the eukaryotic root. And on this slide, I just present the total number of phylum-specific families. For instance, here, this white bar corresponds to the number of uh, domain families that are found specifically in the bacterial subtree. And on top of this, and these are the red slices, I consider the number of domains that have predicted to have originated at the root of this phylum. That is, we predict 1,662 domain families at Luca, uh, having originated at Luca, 770 domain families having originated at the bacterial ancestral node, etc. And what is striking in this analysis is that we have a tiny minority of domain families that are really predicted strongly to be ancestral. And of course, this suggests that since these um, early times, domain innovation has continued to proceed. Now I'm going to, to show you how I analyze this. So how do we analyze the fates of domain families? So here's an example. It's a methanocyanin node for which we have 
4,300 domain families. And we can distinguish vertically inherited domain families in gray, phylum specific domain families that are new, that is, that has not been found in the path between this particular mechanism of final node and the Luca root. New domain families that have been horizontally transferred, that is, they're not phylum specific. And finally, domain families that are not new, but that have been regained. And analyzing these, uh, we can estimate a lower bound for domain innovation, which corresponds to this red sector, and an upper bound, which would be the sum of the red and yellow sectors. So this was applied to all nodes of the taxonomy tree. And here's the global picture. 1,662 of families predicted at Luca. And when we zoom in, uh, OK, we take a while for, for the picture to load, apparently, here. Uh, we can zoom in on bacteria, where we have uh, 2,000, a uh, little more than 2,000 families with some innovation, and some uh, families also that are not specific to bacteria. We zoom in on proteobacteria. Um, now we can uh, see things in a more detail. And what, what is apparent here now at this scale is that there are various types of things happening. Um, there are genome reduction events that are accompanied with a, a shrinkage of the domain repertoire. For instance, here this corresponds to the Rickettsia branch or here to the Buchnera branch in the gamma, proteobacteria. Um, there are cases of high domain innovation. For instance, here, for xanthomonas, or for Neisseria meningitidis, or the rhizobials, or Helobacter pylori. We also find cases of massive horizontal transfer in terms of domain repertoire, about 40%. Most striking example would be Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Rhizonia solanacerum. Now, in these cases, they are leaves of the tree, so these horizontal transfer have to, to mean that these species are recipients, uh, have been very active recipients of uh, domains of foreign origin. So we have expected cases of massive domain losses, which I mentioned just earlier, or Rickettsia, or Bushnera. Uh, so we get shrinkage of the domain repertoire. However, this shrinkage is not necessarily exclusive with the domain innovation. And I'd like you to, uh, to look at what happens with Rickettsia, where we have around 25% of domain innovation despite a considerable reduction in the domain repertoire. So if we proceed further in the bacterial tree, in the case of very high domain innovation, it's about 30% for Staphylococcus aureus. We have only a few cases of domain regain in this analysis. The maximum we find is 8% for Mycoplasma uh, pulmonis. And uh, here is the archaeal subtree where we have an example of massive turnover of the domain repertoire in the case of uh, Methanosarcina. Now here I define um, turnover of the domain repertoire as the average between the number of gained, of domains gained and the domain lost and um, normalized related to the number of domain that were present in the parental species. Finally, in the eukaryotic tree, we got slightly over 5,000 families at the root of the tree. But what is very striking, if you compare this tree with the bacterial tree and the archaeal tree, is that there's much more domain innovation uh, going on in, in higher organisms 
and uh, much less horizontal transfer. So, the conclusions of this work are, first of all, we can infer complex evolutionary scenarios. We can predict them under uh, rigorous maximum likelihood principle. We have now to, to change the, the view we had of, of the evolution of modular protein that I described at the beginning of my talk. So the traditional view of modular protein evolution was that proteins are made of a combinatorial assortment of pre-existing domains, so that new proteins are essentially new assortments of these pre-existing domains. However, the new view I would like to propose is that domain innovation is a continuously ongoing process and that uh, the generation of new modular proteins has proceeds both from this combinatorial reassortment principle and from domain innovation. And my last word on this would be that because of this ongoing domain innovation process, it is very important for protein domain analysis to be systematic, not to confine our analysis to previous knowledge of very popular families for which we've gathered a lot of expertise, but we also need to consider this the, a large number of protein domain families that are specific of a variety of phyla and that are going to pop up in more and more numbers as we get more systematic in genome or metagenome sequencing. So, um, what I would like to propose is that we continue to use Prodom uh, in this, with, with this purpose, because Prodom is really a tool that allows you to systematically infer domains, even for this large set of subsequences for which we have essentially no knowledge about the availability of uh, sequence information. I'd like to, to finish by, by thanking the co-workers on this work. Now, um, work in, was done in large part at, in Toulouse at uh, INRA by uh, Catherine Bru for her thesis work. Emmanuel Courcel has been maintaining our program for several years. Uh, Thomas Schex has introduced the Bayesian network framework in this um, uh, study. And finally, I would like to thank the um, support we've had um, from the Après Séquence Genomic Project with a society called Proteus and also from various uh, agencies, including uh, uh, Toulouse Genopole, EU, also had support last year from uh, Humboldt University. Thanks a lot for your attention. So do we have questions for Daniel Kahn? There is one here, uh, blue t-shirt. So, so Daniel, how, how do you, I probably missed it, but how did you cope with horizontal gene transfer? I mean, if cyanobacteria sees something from eukaryotes, you could see it as very early, the whole domain family. Or mycoplasma, where you say it gained domains, it might have gained it from somebody not sequenced yet. I mean, this kind of stuff. I'm not sure I, I understood the question precisely. Could you, could you reiterate it? Well, you place your domain, as I understand, under a tree and see when the earliest occurrences are, and then you make your, your deductions. So, but if transfer is there and the domain has been transferred from a yogurt to a bacterium, uh, uh, it appears early because it's at both. No. So I missed it. Ah. Yeah, this indeed would, would, would be the result of a naive approach. Uh, what I call the naive approach is to start from a phylogenetic profile and to map the putative origin of the family to the lowest common ancestor of all the current species which contain a particular domain of a family. So this is the naive approach because of course, because of horizontal transfer, the more information you have, the more the probability uh, increases that there will be a few cases of horizontal transfer that will shift this lowest common ancestor uh, all the way to the root. So by using this type of method, you would grossly overestimate Yes, but, but okay, oh. I agree that for the tips of the tree you avoid the stuff, but lots of transfer happen rather early. 
So it means you have tons of proteobacteria having the same domain, uh, uh, and, and when it happened there, it's very hard to distinguish. Yes, we can. We use this um, Bayesian network model in which we have conditional probabilities associated with each edge for gain or loss of domain. And what we do is we calculate the most probable evolutionary scenario uh, that accounts for the evidence, that is, the present day distribution of domains in current genomes. And from this, we infer a putative origin. We are not always able to, to predict a, an origin unambiguously, but we can predict um, which nodes have a reasonable probability of having contained this particular domain, even though there may be also a horizontal transfer event. So this is the strength of the Bayesian network approach, in that it, it, it takes into account more complex scenarios. Unlike uh, the dollar parsimony, for instance, which allows only loss events, and then clearly you cannot do this type of analysis. Uh, all right. Uh, any any more questions? Just, just one more. Oh, well, I got the microphone. <laughs> Sorry, where are you? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Daniel, hi. Okay. Um, yeah, could I uh, to ask about an, uh, another layer of complexity for your scenario? I, it's this thing of what you might call either, either domain death or domain drift. Uh, it's always curious that um, if you look at the so if you look at all the proteases by ancestry, about somewhere but over 12% of them are actually catalytically dead. So the domain is, is clearly drifting off into something else. And we know examples, for example, in the, the famous example of the PDZ domain, where you've got two kind of a neo-functionalization where they're kind of drifting apart. I wonder if you can see in your system this kind of subtle, subtle shifts or uh, what you might call a neo-functionalization of older domains, whether you can track it. Mm. Well, of course, uh, the proton domain families are homology-based, and, and they don't, uh, uh, they don't, we don't do this analysis of, uh, say, uh, functional uh, um, residues being present or not. Uh, so we say nothing about activity or function. We just say something about occurrence of a particular type of domain, whichever its function. Um, so, um, so I'm afraid I cannot say much more. Um, of course, a domain that would have completely died, uh, we wouldn't see in present-day genome, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, what we infer? But you would see it because it still has a sequence signal. That's the thing. You see, you can see domains that may have, have died in the functional or, or uh, but you still see them, and you will still see a sequence signal, even if there's a loss of critical residues. Yes, yeah, so uh, you can't. Yeah. Okay, I'm afraid I'll have to stop you there uh, for the next one. Just remember to thank once again Daniel Kahn for a fascinating talk.